lecture is brought to you by the McClung Museum of Natural History and Culture at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Joan Markle. I am the curator of the Civil War at the museum. And our lecture series has been going on for the past 10 years, looking at the significance of the four years of Civil War on the culture of East Tennessee. This year, the theme for the lecture series has been generals of the Civil War who contributed significantly to events here and to the legacy of the Civil War in East Tennessee. The lectures started in January. First one was about uh, Simon Bolivar Buckner, general from Kentucky, whose influence on what happened in Knoxville was significant. He was here. He was the general who Confederate general who evacuated Knoxville and left it undefended for the Union Army to walk in. The second general that we looked at was Ambrose Burnside. Burnside was from, actually he was born in, in Indiana, but went to West Point and uh, ended up basically living in Rhode Island, his wife's home state for most of his life. And, and Burnside came with the Union Army in September of 63 into East Tennessee, the first, the first time that East Tennessee was actually occupied by Union troops. This week, I'm talking about General James Longstreet. Longstreet was a Confederate general. He came to Knoxville and under very interesting circumstances, and he was the Confederate general who led the assault on Fort Sanders in November of 1863. Then the last lecture in the series is going to be about James Long, I'm sorry, about um, William Tecumseh Sherman. And Sherman, whose legacy is very well known, um, probably in a still in a very bad light in the South and yet in a much more positive light in the North, Sherman was had a story to tell about East Tennessee. Most people don't realize that that happened. So that's the, those are the uh, topics and the form of the lecture series. As I said, this is our 10th year, so we have lots and lots of areas that have already been covered, but an in-depth look at the men, the lives and personalities of these men who were the top decision makers in both armies, um, it's very, it's informative look, to look at what they did in East Tennessee and how that affected the course of the war here. Um, let's look at James Longstreet. James Longstreet, nicknamed Old Pete by his troops, also by his family, Pete was his family nickname, was a man who lived a long life of service. Uh, as a young man, he, you can see his picture there on the left, the middle, is a photograph that was probably what he looked like when he was here in Knoxville. And then he lived on to be 85 years old. So there's a picture of him in his old age with serious Burnside sideburns. That facial hair was uh, very popular amongst Civil War soldiers and even more so popular amongst veterans. This is James Longstreet's life in pictures. Let's look at how he lived it, and how he happened to be here in East Tennessee. All accidents of history. Well, James Longstreet was born at a time where his particular talents would come to the forefront. As apparently as a small boy, he always wanted to be a soldier. He lived his childhood as if he were going to be a soldier. And he just happened to be born into a time and place where events and opportunities allowed individuals to emerge. He used, well, let's not say he used, let's say he was the recipient of a certain spotlight in history because of the American Civil War. It created the stage upon which multiple personalities could enact their roles. And think about who writes history, how things get interpreted, how the whole mass of events and facts and figures and dates and times and impressions and letters and diaries, all of that goes into creating the threads that we call history. There are many shades of gray and things get ignored in the creations of 
the extremes, our myths and legends. Simplification, leaving things out, adding things, enhancing. But heroes and failures are all extracted from the same pool of recorded facts. And Longstreet has a huge amount of information that has been recorded on his behalf as a general in the Civil War. He was actually born in 1821 in South Carolina. He lived in 1904. He saw the 20th century come in. Um, he was 80, 40 year, 85 years old when he died. Um, and he never questioned his loyalty as a Southerner when the war began. A number of uh, Civil War figures, we, we find them soul searching, trying to decide one way or the other how, what, to, what to do in the event in this in the real event of needing to needing to choose their loyalty, their political positions, and then actually put their lives on the line to fight. Longstreet's course was clear. He didn't seem to have any reservations ever about choosing to fight for the South, and he that's what he did. Um, he was actually a West Point graduate, 1842. He was 54th out of 56 in terms of academic standing. He would be the first to admit he was not a scholar, but he passed. Uh, however, he was often referred to as one of the very best writers that the Academy had ever produced. And he was a very popular student. One of his best friends at West Point was Ulysses S. Grant, called Sam by his friends. Sam's wife, uh, was actually introduced to him by Longstreet. Uh, Longstreet's mother was a dent, and there was a young cousin, rather distant cousin, but still same family name of Dent. Julia Dent was introduced to Grant and became his wife. Actually, Grant and Longstreet were close friends before, a little bit of hiatus during, but then close friends after the Civil War and their family contact was something that was a part of that. Uh, in 1861, Longstreet was 40 years old and he was the height of his military career. And according to at least one biographer, Jeffrey Wart, that's one of the, one of the best biograph biographies of Longstreet, um, he was the best corps commander on either side. Um, it, some people would debate that, but his reputation as uh, a man who, under the command of Robert E. Lee, uh, did good and valuable and professional military service, um, I don't think that's disputed. Um, and as all of the reunions and testimonials and diaries and letters show that Longstreet was greatly respected by his men, always. Now he started in, with the Mexican War, um, had a Western post, he accepted a CSA commission in the war, um, but he, uh, and so he was with this, uh, the Union Army, uh, or the National Army, when the war began, but he accepted very early on a commission in this, this Confederate Army's and perhaps he accepted that commission even before he had officially resigned from the U.S. Army. In any case, he was there at the beginning, and he assembled one of the best staffs in either army. That, that's generally credited to him by, by most of the people who talk about the things that he did. And from the first day of the war, first battle of the war, starting at the first Bull Run, first Manassas, Longstreet was there in combat. Some of the people that he assembled for his staff, E. Porter Alexander, who went on to be a general, of course, chief of art artillery. Uh, Moxley Sorrell was his chief of staff. Um, I want to point out that these names, when they are referred to Confederate soldiers, um, that I tried to put them in gold color and also put the pictures framed in gold when it's a union name or union picture, it'll be in blue. Uh, it's very difficult when you're talking about Civil War, especially 
uh, names of less famous generals, uh, to, to, you can't tell by the name which side that they're on. And uh, in, a pic, in a presentation like this, it helps to color code it. Even if in the beginning you say E. Porter Alexander of the Confederate Army, five minutes later, if you say E. Porter Alexander, you really always need to know which side a person was on. Um, interesting, this is just a little sidelight. <laughs> Knoxville interest. There was a young officer on Longstreet staff who's on his staff the whole time. His name was Peyton Manning. Uh, that's a picture of uh, Longstreet's Peyton Manning on the left and a picture of the football Peyton Manning on the right. Um, it's They were probably related to each other. I haven't been able to get the genealogy uh, to be very specific on that topic. If you go and look for Peyton football players, the, the his uh, parents, uh, uh, the, let's see, his Peyton Manning grandparents, so his Manning grandparents, one said is their names are listed most places as Bud and Sis. Now you can imagine Bud and Sis are not going to exist on their birth certificates. So that's just one of the little uh, difficulties in finding uh, direct links in ge genealogy. Now, I haven't done this too recently. It may be now that it's easier to do, but um, in any case, it's Peyton Manning and his Civil War ancestor. However, uh, another little glitch to this, Peyton Manning of Civil War times did not come to Knoxville. He was um, incapacitated in Chattanooga or Battle of Chickamauga and did not come on to Knoxville. So he wasn't actually here, but he was always and he did return to Longstreet staff. Now, looking at um, the major battles of Burnside and Longstreet, uh, the first one was First Manassas Bull Run. And then on the Pennsylvania campaign, Longstreet, this is a list of the battles that Longstreet was in. He was in Yorktown and Williamsburg and Seven Pines. Um, he was at Second Bull Run. He was at Antietam. And this again was with, uh, opposed to Burnside. He was at Fredericksburg with Burnside as his opposition. Now Burnside, by that I mean the Union General, Ambrose Burnside, who was his major adversary here in Knoxville. Um, then at Gettysburg, Burnside by that time had been shipped to the West, so Burnside wasn't at Gettysburg, but James Longstreet most definitely was. Um, in the Western Theater, we've got East Tennessee, Battle of Chickamauga, then Chattanooga, then the Knoxville Campaign, which featured the Battle of Fort Sanders. And then when he returned to Virginia, he was Battle of the Wilderness, where he was badly wounded and then he was at Petersburg. So you can see from the beginning of the war to the end of the war, James Longstreet was on the front lines. He also, in the Appomattox campaign that closed the war in April of 65, he participated in that. Now, as the war progressed, things happened in General Longstreet's life that were uh, truly very tragic. A personal family tragedy in 1862. Three of his children died of scarlet fever in Richmond. A fourth child, a son, nearly, nearly died also. Um, and from reports by his staff and others close to him, this, this event changed his outlook, changed his personality. He was a different man after this um, severe family tragedy. Um, he had a very special relationship with Robert E. Lee, and especially after the death of Stonewall Jackson, uh, Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh, anyway, James Longstreet was there, and he became uh, one of those on whom Robert E. Lee relied significantly. He was a man who was, uh, for whom Lee had great respect and for whom we was depended uh, in, in battle situations. Um, Longstreet was in many battles in Virginia and Maryland, and he was very famously at the defeat at Gettysburg. And at the Battle of Gettysburg, that's where the controversy began uh, about his relationship to the uh, orders of Robert E. Lee, his willingness to enact the orders, his criticism, his uh, slowness, all of those things 
factor into his reputation being tarnished, tarnished, but also in comparison to Robert E. Lee, whose reputation was greatly elevated, uh, he seemed even um, more maligned. Anyway, he, Robert E. Lee referred to Longstreet as his old war horse. And after Pickett's charge, which Longstreet felt was a horrible decision, um, and then it was proved that it was a horrible decision, there was a great discussion as to the sequence of events, how much resistance actually that Longstreet produced, was his timing bad, all of those things. Uh, and then, of course, as I said, with the wonderful reputation of Robert E. Lee, in contrast, it made it seem, all seem even worse. At any rate, he was um, put on something called the Lost Cause Blacklist, the Lost Cause being the um, mythological uh, elevation of many elements of the war in the South to uh, soften the impact, to justify the loss, all of those things. Lee became immortalized and Longstreet was put into a position of, of someone who did not support Lee when he should have. This is um, obviously a, a painting of the battle at Gettysburg. What you can see is the Union line with all of the artillery firing into the Confederate charge. This is Pickett's charge. These Confederate troops had to run over open land into gunfire. The plan basically was to overwhelm the Union artillery with the men coming straight at them. And of course, it, it didn't work. It was a horrible scene of carnage and bloodshed and was something that Longstreet had said very accurately before it even happened, that, that no men, no matter how, how well-trained, how enthusiastic, how, how experienced could succeed in this charge that was proposed by Lee. But it happened. Pickett was uh, under Longstreet's command. Longstreet couldn't bring himself to actually issue the order. Pickett asked Longstreet, should I charge? And Longstreet kind of nodded his head. So this is what happened. Another painting um, of the event, this is from behind the Union line. You can see all of the soldiers and the artillery and officers on horseback. And you can look out over that long, flat, empty field across which the Confederates were charging into artillery. Um, e. Porter Alexander, I've mentioned him before. He was with Longstreet throughout the war. He was the one who actually conducted the artillery barrage before the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, it was the most incredible artillery, artillery barrage at that point, and perhaps one of the most, one, no, I shouldn't say wonderful, not say terrible, but, but impressive show um, before the battle. Uh, this was, he was a young man who was here with Longstreet, his, was his artillery, uh, was in charge of artillery here in Knox Street, and he tried to tell Longstreet that the order to charge, in order to create the salt here on the November 29th, 1863, that that was, that was a bad idea, and he, he, he was overruled. In any case, this Confederate army is defeated at Gettysburg study of the Battle of Gettysburg with three days there uh, is it, volumes and volumes and volumes have been written about it. Um, but basically what happened was that defeat the army of George Meade defeated the army of Robert E. Lee and Lee retreated back across the Rappahannock River back into Virginia. And Lincoln says to Meade, why didn't you pursue? Lincoln is always having to say to his generals, first attack and then pursue and why are you sitting there? And he was, Lincoln was extremely frustrated with the situation right after Gettysburg. But Robert E. Lee and, and his army did get back into Virginia. Um, Longstreet suggested at this point, and he had already suggested before, and now it seems like a good time to do it, he had suggested sending troops to the West to help support 
what was going on basically in Chattanooga, Middle Tennessee at this point. Well, Chattanooga is East Tennessee, but in any case, uh, what was happening in the Western Theater. Um, remember, the Western Theater really is uh, most of the stuff, it's, it's not west of the, well, that, that's not true. Let's say that most of what happens in the Western Theater is related to the state of Tennessee. Uh, there are more battles and skirmishes in Tennessee than any other state besides Virginia. So when they're talking about going to the Western Theater, supporting the Western troops, it's because of action in Tennessee at this point. Um, he suggests he gets sent, and again, the Southwest in this case is Tennessee, uh, to General Braxton Bragg, and he uh, then sees action in North Georgia and Southeast Tennessee. And he, Longstreet is in favor of this. He, um, uh, several biographers and writers about Longstreet believe he is interested in independent command, and he's particularly interested in the job position held by Braxton Bragg in, uh, East, in East Tennessee. Um, Robert E. Lee, in fact, supported this plan of action. Lee had no interest in going west himself, but he was in favor of sending Longstreet and his corps to the, to the uh, fighting in East Tennessee. Um, however, when they made all these plans, in the interim, what happened was that Knoxville and basically up and down the train route in East Tennessee was taken by the Federals under General Ambrose Burnside. Problem being that Longstreet and his troops could not take the shortest, most direct, single gauge route by train from Virginia to Chattanooga that was blocked by federal forces. So they had to come up with an alternate plan and they had to come up with it very quickly if they were gonna be effective at all. So you can see on this slide, this is a, a wonderful map of the train route of, uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, oh, just, okay. Anyway, this is the way troops had to come from the Washington area, Longstreet, all of these different railroads, all of these different connections. If they could have taken the train, and this isn't, ex this isn't precise, it would have probably come through Lynchburg and come down here through Knoxville, down here to Chattanooga. That was the way they thought they could go when they originally made the plan. However, because Knoxville was held by the, Confeder by the Union at this point, then they had to put all of this into place. It is amazing that they did it. And they did it in a short enough time to actually affect the outcome of the battle here at Chattanooga. And this is what it looked like. All of these cobbled together trains, they had artillery, they had boxcars, the guys are all sitting on the top of the train, more artillery top of the train, apparently um, once or twice, low hanging branches, tunnels, that sort of thing, wiped a few guys off the top of the car, but uh, on the whole, most of them made it to, uh, to East Tennessee. And there was, this is at Ringgold, Georgia. This is the arrival of the Confederate troops. This is, they came in time to make a difference on the second day of the Battle of Chickamauga. And um, the stories about uh, knocking out, for instance, they take cars, these, you can imagine it's not too comfortable in there. It's hot, it's cold, it's bumpy, it's noisy. Uh, and sometimes the troops just kicked out the sidewall so that it was nice and aerated with a, uh, with a roof on top. Um, apparently everything that rolled put in, was put into service to get the troops uh, through the south. And uh, on the way, everything was so wonderfully um, welcoming for these troops. This was the Deep South. They hadn't been there before. The troops, I mean, their fighting had been on some on the coast, but not in the interior where a lot of the train lines were. And um, they, they, a lot of the guys, the letters talk about what this, this incredible journey and the support and they'd come to town and they'd be fed, wined and dined and partied. And uh, so anyway, it was an adventure of a lifetime for many of them. Now, Battle of Chickamauga. This is happening down in the, on the border uh, between Georgia and East Tennessee. 
And um, basically, after the defeat at Gettysburg and the defeat at Vicksburg, what that is, U.S. Grant took um, uh, the Mississippi River after after the town of Vicksburg finally fell. And so there's a feeling that the South is about to finish up, that they are, that they've been, had these two serious defeats. Now the, Vic, the Confederacy, the Mississippi River is now open to the Union and um, the Northern thrust of Lee's army is stopped. So there's a feeling that it's gonna be over very soon. But then happens, the Battle of Chickamauga. George Thomas, a Union uh, um, general, he, this is where he earns his title, the Rock of Chickamauga. He was in charge until Grant came. Rosecrans, who what, had been the federal general in charge, was replaced. He was, he, he did not look good after what happened at Chickamauga, and now the Union Army is under siege in Chattanooga. And um, the outcome of that battle of Chickamauga was directly, uh, part of it was due to the uh, arrival and the very good performance of Longstreet and his troops. Anyway, um, down in Chattanooga, the Union Army is also reinforcing. They're sending troops from um, Northern Virginia to reinforce Federals and they couldn't go through, uh, well, Let's show that map. Oh, okay, John Bell Hood, he came down with um, uh, Longstreet. So he is there. He had lost the use of his right arm at Gettysburg, but managed to, uh, decided he needed to come south or west with Longstreet. And then at the Battle of Chickamauga, he also lost a leg. So this guy was pretty much out of commission for quite a while, and there were two young uh, officers, Evanda Law and Micah Jenkins, who both were contending uh, to take over Longstreet's leadership in, in the, the Confederate troops. Um, this is Micah Jenkins and Evanda Law, and they are both uh, part of Longstreet's team. Uh, he uh, favors one, the other tr troops favor the other, and they appears to be conflict between these two guys that significantly alters the course of uh, events as Longstreet tries to get through uh, his independent command and make good on his uh, his promise to do some good in East Tennessee. Um, here is Joseph Hooker, Union General. His troops are sent down from the north. They are reinforcing Rosecrans, who has been replaced by Thomas until Grant can get there from Vicksburg. And now coming down to help things even more and getting it more confused, we, this is Braxton Bragg on the left and Jefferson Davis on the right. And the Confederate command is in a terrible state. Everybody is revolting against Bragg. Bragg has some very serious shortcomings, um, but he's also continually undermined by his subordinates. There's an excellent book that Dr. Earl Hess from Lincoln Memorial University has put out about Braxton Bragg, which is fascinating to look at that man. But these two are the main um, uh, actors in trying to calm down Confederate generals, get them all to work together. It's a serious problem with troops, morale, everything that's going on in Chattanooga. Anyway, Jefferson Davis shows up to help. He has already told brag that his command is safe. However, that turns out after when this events transpire in Chattanooga that it, it changes and Bragg is replaced. But at this time in, in uh, September, October, Bragg feels confident that his position is secure. Um, there is something called a round robin letter. Round robin meaning basically it's it's signed in it's written by somebody, but then everybody who signs it, it's not clear where it originated. It's just a letter that is supported by many different generals. It's thought that it was probably written by Leonidas Polk and Simon Buckner. Um, and there are indications that's probably true, but those were only two of the signatures, or uh, I better not say that. I think Polk but to sign it. In any case, he supported it. Um, when Bragg retaliates, he's basically 
anybody who was whose name was on this letter is going to be punished for their insubordination. And Longstreet, who is from the Army of Northern Virginia, he can't he um, uh, can't be demoted. So basically, he is sent away. And the idea to retake Knoxville, while it might have had some military benefit, um, was in large part to do the fact that Bragg wanted Longstreet to remove himself from Chattanooga. Anyway, Davis was the one who came up with the idea of sending Longstreet to retake Knoxville, according to most sources. Um, it seemed to be supported by Robert E. Lee, and Robert E. Lee even said, well, if I had known that the Union or the Federals had taken Knoxville, we could have sent Longstreet to take retake Knoxville first. Um, but that suggests another whole scenario that, uh, that didn't happen. But because of that idea, Davis and Bragg seem to think that Lee supported the idea of, of Longstreet going to take Knoxville. Anyway, um, Grant had a quote in his, uh, his autobiography, which is, it's just one of the times Davis aided the Union cause with his superior military knowledge. Just a little bit sarcastic. So Davis, Longstreet, Bragg, not working well together, and Longstreet is sent to retake Knoxville. On to independent command. Longstreet, along with his infantry, about 15,000 altogether, cavalry and artillery, get on a train in uh, near Chattanooga. Takes them about 11 days to get everybody to Sweetwater, Tennessee. Any element of surprise is absolutely lost. Longstreet is not happy, is convinced that it's going to be a failure and has no maps, has limited supplies, and is um, actually delighted probably to get out of Chattanooga, but his next few months go very much against him. In the next chapter, part of this lecture series, we will have, well, part two, and we'll look at what happens to Longstreet in Upper East Tennessee, Battle of Fort Sanders, and the winter that he spends in Russellville.